We are just about 24 hours away from the scheduled undocking of Boeing Starliner spacecraft. For weeks now, teams have been busy adjusting the mission plan and flight profile, knowing the vehicle will now return without a crew. In just the last few days, cargo has been loaded onto the spacecraft in addition to thorough inspections inside the vehicle. With these steps complete, today the hatch is set to be closed, and assuming everything goes as planned, won't be opened until Starliner is back on Earth. Here I'll go more in depth into the last minute departure activities, final milestones, an updated uncrewed reentry process, and more. If everything stays on schedule, the uncrewed Starliner is scheduled to undock from the Harmony Module's forward port at 6.04 p.m. EDT on Friday the 6th, and land in New Mexico about six hours later. About 20 minutes before the undocking, NASA is expected to begin live streaming the event. In the event it gets pushed back due to weather or any other reasons, they have backup dates on the 10th, 14th, 18th, and so on. They did mention a slight weather concern related to rain, but the chances of an undock tomorrow were still high. In terms of final prep, crews on the ISS have been busy. Yesterday, NASA astronauts Butch Wilmore and Sonny Williams spent the day loading cargo inside the Boeing Starliner spacecraft for a return to Earth. NASA highlighted that the pair removed Starliner's crew seats, which will be later reinstalled, for better access when storing the extra cargo, then photographed and inspected the spaceship's cabin ahead of its hatch closure scheduled for Thursday. Yesterday, on the 4th, there was also another media teleconference, this time focused on the undocking and return of the spacecraft. Here we learn that after the undocking and before the reentry burn, they're planning a number of thruster firings to continue trying to gather information and determine the issue. Since these thrusters are in the service module, soon before reentry, the module will disconnect from the capsule and end up burning up in the atmosphere. In other words, these test thruster firings will be the last opportunity to directly gather data from the module. More specifically, Steve Stish, the commercial crew program manager, said, We're going to look at doing a couple of hot fires on the way with some of the thrusters. In fact, that's going to the Starliner mission management team today, and we're going to talk about maybe hot firing after we undock, after we clear what we call the approach ellipsoid around the space station. We'll go ahead and maybe hot fire a few of those thrusters, the forward thrusters, and maybe the aft thrusters. And the purpose of this is to continue to learn, he said. In the past, they had mentioned that they were planning to perform a slightly different undocking that would position the vehicle away from the station quicker than normal. Recently, they clarified that it was called a breakout burn and would involve a much faster departure from the station. The NASA Space Station flight director said in a quote, Without the crew on board, able to take manual control if needed, there's just a lot less variables that we need to account for when we do the breakout burn, and allows us to get the vehicle on a trajectory home that much sooner. Interestingly, Steve Stish added, It really puts less stress on the thrusters. In other words, there are a lot fewer thruster firings. Essentially, about 30 seconds after undock, we'll start the small series of burns, using primarily the forward thrusters, not putting stress on the aft thrusters. It really just takes about five minutes or so to actually execute that whole sequence, he said. This makes it more clear that the goal is to both speed up the process, but also avoid using certain thrusters due to the complications over the past couple of months. Steve Stish also talked about the issue with the thrusters and said, Clearly, the way we fire the thrusters causes the thrusters to overheat. We need to understand what kinds of pulses in particular cause that swelling, the number of pulses. He went on to say, We know the thrusters are working well when we don't command them in a manner that overheats them and gets the poppet to swell. We know that the thruster is a viable thruster, he said. These comments, among others, suggest that they're planning to possibly change how the thrusters are used in the future rather than change the hardware itself. In one final quote, he said, The easiest thing to do is figure out how do we lower the temperature the thruster is operating at and maybe not firing it in a manner that causes it to have this overheating phenomena. Without a crew, a lot of the mission milestones and general events after undocking needed to be altered. By now, the agency has a detailed flight profile of exactly what we can expect when Starliner does begin its journey back to Earth. Initially, approximately 24 hours before undocking, NASA will analyze weather predictions for the various landing sites. Winds at the selected landing site must be 6 miles per hour or less when flying with crew, and approximately 13 miles per hour or less when uncrewed. Ground temperatures must be warmer than 15 degrees Fahrenheit, and the cloud ceiling must be at least 1,000 feet. One nautical mile of visibility is required, and the area must be clear to precipitation, thunderstorms, and lightning within approximately a 22-mile or 35-kilometer radius. When teams proceed with undocking, Starliner will complete a series of departure burns, allowing it to reach its landing site in about six hours. A final weather check also occurs before the spacecraft's deorbit burn. Winds must be at or below 10 miles per hour. If winds exceed these limits, teams will waive the deorbit burn, and Starliner will target another landing attempt between 24 and 31 hours later. After it's left the station and made its way from the ISS, it'll begin the reentry process. NASA highlights that once cleared to proceed, Starliner executes its deorbit burn, which lasts approximately 60 seconds, slowing it down enough to re-enter Earth's atmosphere and committing the spacecraft to its targeted site. 
Immediately after the deorbit burn, Starliner repositions for service module disposal, which will burn up during reentry over the southern Pacific Ocean. Following service module separation, the command module maneuvers into reentry position. During reentry, the capsule experiences plasma buildup, reaching temperatures up to 3,000 degrees Fahrenheit, that may interrupt communications with the spacecraft for approximately four minutes. Assuming it makes it through that point, the forward heat shield, located on top of the spacecraft, is jettisoned at 30,000 feet, exposing the two drogue parachutes and three manned parachutes for deployment. The parachutes will continue to slow the spacecraft down as the base heat shield is jettisoned at 3,000 feet, allowing the six landing bags to inflate. At touchdown, the spacecraft is traveling at approximately 4 miles per hour. The NASA and Boeing landing and recovery teams will be stationed at a holding zone near Starliner's intended landing site. After landing, a series of five teams move in toward the spacecraft in a sequential order. The first team to approach the spacecraft is the Gold Team, using equipment that sniffs the capsule for any hypergolic fuels that didn't fully burn off before re-entry. They also cover the spacecraft's thrusters. Once given the all-clear, the Silver Team moves in. This team electrically grounds and stabilizes Starliner before the green team approaches, supplying power and cooling to the crew module since the spacecraft is powered down. From here, the blue team follows, documenting the recovery for public dissemination and future process review. The red team, which includes Boeing Fire Rescue, emergency medical technicians, and human factor engineers, then proceed to Starliner, opening the hatch. Finally, the landing and recovery teams begin unloading time-critical cargo from Starliner. The spacecraft is then transferred to Boeing's facilities at NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida for refurbishment ahead of its next flight. One of the pros of an uncrewed return rather than crewed is the less strict weather conditions necessary for the undocking to go ahead. At the same time, we have already seen two uncrewed Starliners return in the past with OFT-1 and OFT-2. This now will make the third uncrewed Starliner return. The main concern for the return has to do with the re-entry burn itself. Yesterday, Stitch said, Relay the thrusters on the service module, the next big job they have is to hold attitude, while the big O max fire. Like Anthony said, it's about a 60 second deorbit burn, and that's the critical thing that needs to happen to get the crew module on a safe trajectory to enter the atmosphere and then land at White Sands. There's good redundancy in those thrusters. We've got four thrusters in each direction, so we expect that to go well, he said. Once it returns, the start of even more work will begin. Stish said, after we get the vehicle back, we'll go through a couple of months of post-flight analysis of the trajectory and how the thrusters perform during the final phase of flight. We also are already working hand-in-hand -hand with Boeing to look at modifications to the system. Are there ways that we can fly the vehicle differently? Do we need to do some more thruster testing at White Sands to fill in some of the gaps that we had perhaps in qualification? So all that is going to start taking place, and there are teams starting to look at what we do to get the vehicle fully certified in the future, he said. In just about one day, Starliner is set to undock and perform a number of important milestones in an attempt to successfully re-enter the atmosphere and land. While there's no crew aboard, it's still important that the spacecraft comes back in one piece. We will have to wait and see how it progresses and the impact it has on the space industry. Thank you very much for watching.